needed to live for the three guys that didn't live that day. Now, there was uh, <laughs> something along those lines in the well, of things. Yeah, you know, if, if you take, if you talk to therapists and psychologists, and you know, there's what we call survivor's guilt. And, yeah. You know, if you say you you want to live your life for your guys, they can kind of, kind of say that survivor's guilt. You're you're not really living your own life. You're living the life for them. And, and I'm not, I'm, I'm living my life. I just want to live a life that they're going to be proud of. So when they're looking down on me, they can say, yeah, you know, uh, he's survived, but he's doing good things because of it. So uh, I don't like the term survivor's guilt. Obviously, I know I lost guys. Uh, I, you know, I think about them all the time, but I have what I call survivor's pride uh, because I'm proud of the guys. I'm, I'm proud of what they stood for. I'm proud of the, the men they were. I'm proud that I got to serve with them. Uh, I'm probably going to carry them in my heart every day. Um, so the survivor's guilt doesn't, that just kind of irritates me. I think there's a lot of pride and, you know, in, in me wanting to tell their stories or, you know, just remember them, that to me isn't, isn't bad. That's, that's positive. So it should be called survivor's pride. So 18 months into it, you're starting to get the very, at least signs of independence. Right. Where does it go from there? I was just pretty much Monday through Friday going to rehab. Still, uh, obviously, it's still a lot of work to do, a lot of joint issues, a lot of surgeries I still have to go through. But having, you know, about six months after I got the first prosthetic, I got the second prosthetic. So there was a lot more learning to, to dress myself, learning um, just everyday basic activities again. So I'd go to rehab. And, and at first, it was physical therapy. Physical therapy is set up to get you back on your feet, get you moving up here. And then you go through occupational therapy. Occupational therapy is uh, more of your everyday activities that you have to, to learn how to redo. So, uh, you know, learning to cook, learning to dress, learning pretty much everything all over again. Um, so that pretty much was my life. And then, you know, I was doing some, some different events. There's obviously a lot of nonprofits that visit the guys in the hospital that, and they wanted to take you on events and go do stuff. and. And I did a few different ones, and after a few of them, um, you know, for me, I, I really didn't want to go as a participant anymore. Um, I didn't want to just be another wounded guy going in and doing stuff. I would rather get involved and, and maybe help coach or mentor the new guys coming in or, you know, do something. So I, I, I actively started seeking out more opportunities to be able to get back versus being the guy just going through it. Was that part of wanting to fight, wanting to survive, and wanting to find out what this new world was going to be? Well, that and and obviously, you know, I I'm lucky. I was 30 years old when I got blown up, so um, there was a little bit more life experience. There's a little bit more maturity than say somebody who was 18 who graduated high school, went to basic, went to AIT, went to a unit, deployed, got hurt right away and hasn't experienced anything outside of high school and, and maybe a few months of combat. Um, those guys struggle a lot more than I did because I just have more to kind of re revolve back on. I mean, you know, my whole military um, career is always don't quit, never give up. There's a lot of times where you'd want to give up or you thought about it, but you just didn't do it. And this was that same situation. So uh, as a leader, you give back, you watch out for the other guys, and that's kind of what the role I was kind of taking on. So, hey, how many times have you been back? Uh, three times. So the first trip, though, was late in 09? Yeah, so the first time I went as a participant, uh, basically you go back as to gain closure, see what Iraq was like, uh, see how the, you know things had changed, go to the different areas. Everywhere, every um, either FOB or or uh, patrol base, everywhere we went, we did like town hall meetings where the wounded guys would sit up at the front table and they'd pack the room full of the service members that were over there. And we'd tell our stories and we'd allow them to ask us questions. And um, it, was, it was two parts. One, for us, it was, it was a healing aspect. The more you tell your story, the more you kind of come to terms with it. So uh, a lot of the guys hadn't told their story at all before, so it was very, very emotional. Uh, and then a lot of the, the guys that were serving hadn't seen anybody like us yet, you know, and so they had questions. So we opened it up at the end and it was no holds barred. You could ask us anything or everything you could possibly think of. And 
and uh, we try to use some humor and stuff to lighten the mood, and that's kind of one of the things. That can't be easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's easier than you think, because, you know, the military, we, we talk to each other in a certain language, and uh, we can make anything into humor, and I wouldn't, I mean, even going through the surgeries and, and rehab, all of us were joking. There was always laughter in those rooms. There was, there was always something to, to chuckle at. So when, when things would kind of, in these town hall meetings, and when some of the questions would get too depressing, then, you know, a lot of the times myself or one of the other guys, we'd lighten the mood with a joke or some humor, and, and then we'd go on to the next question. And uh, then we take each of the women back to where they were actually injured at, whether they were, you know, it was gunfire, artillery round, uh, IED, whatever it was, we'd go back to that location so they could then kind of, uh, the main thing is like, when you're wounded in combat, you really don't leave that, that combat tour on your own. No. So this gave you the ability to see where you're injured, and then at the end of the trip, which was eight days in Iraq, you were leaving the country on your own two feet or of your own will. Did that, was that healing? Did that help you heal? Yeah, and, and you gotta remember, you know, the, the violence in Iraq is like a pyramid. So when we first invaded in 03, uh, there wasn't a lot of killed in action, there wasn't a lot of wounded, because the enemy's not dumb, they were evaluating us, they were seeing how we operate. And as they did that, then going into 04, our numbers started to rise. In 05, our numbers had basically doubled from what they were at the invasion. So the U.S. had to do something. So the U.S.'s um, kind of answer to that was to the search, fill the countryside with, with more people, do a big sweep across the country, look for the IDs, look for caches, look for the sales. And obviously when we tripled our numbers, the, with that many IEDs and things already in place, our numbers then again went triple of what they were at the beginning of the war. So in late 05 going into early 08, is what we call the surge, and the numbers were three times higher. So if you and look you were, at- You were part of that, you're, you're- I was in that time zone. So and I was basically, uh, actually it was like early 06 to early 08, but so I was right in the heat of things. So if you were to go to the, the memorials at all the different major uh, units, 101st, 82nd, 2nd ID, 10th Mountain, and look at their their memorial placards for every um, rotation they did in Iraq, the one in that time frame, their names are filled. Um, there was a lot of sectarian violence, there was a lot of Sunni and Shia violence, a lot of the violence that we were seeing wasn't even directed at us. Um, so. When we went back, I mean, the markets were full. People were out. I mean, um, if I were to stand in one place for 24 hours uh, when I was there, I'd hear between 40 and 50 engagements. That could be gunfire, that could be artillery, that could be mortars, that could be IEDs going off. But just with an air shot, I could hear 40 to 50 things per day. When I went back for the first time in those eight days, I heard two things. Wow. I heard two. One was artillery and one was gunfire two things in eight days. That shows you the level of violence that we had in 2010. Um, what that to me was a win. What do you think of Iraq now and the Islamic State? Um, obviously, you know, people, the whole reason, I mean, whether or not we found weapons of mass destruction, whether or not um, you agree with the war is irrelevant. The, the, the relevance is that when I was over there, we saw people who wanted more freedom. Uh, we, we saw brutality. We, we were there making a difference whether or not that's what was portrayed in the media or not. Uh, and it's hard to kind of tell people that because they weren't showing it on the news. Uh, now they're showing it on the news because we're not there. So the same things that were going on are now going on. You know, the Christians are being prosecuted and killed. Uh, villages are being overrun. Uh, and I think that was the whole reason why we were there. We, we took care of that. They left because we were there. Uh, and we all knew when we pulled out, uh, it was going to happen. Everybody predicted this. Uh, anyone who, who was over there and saw what was going on said, the minute we leave, it's, it's going right back. What do you think about that? Uh, I want to go over there and kill people. I mean, uh, unfortunately, you know, violence isn't always the answer. For a lot of things in this world, violence is the only answer. 
Uh, if they think they can, if a bully thinks he can beat up on you every single day, he's gonna beat up on you every single day. But if you put a deterrent in there, that bully isn't gonna want to mess with you because there's that deterrent. There's that one thing that he might not want to go up against. Uh, you know, if you think about, you know, the treaty and uh, North Korea versus South Korea. North Korea could have probably come down multiple times and, and re-engaged South Korea. But there's deterrent. The U.S. is that we have uh, service members throughout that whole peninsula. Uh, we have them on the DMZ. We have them just south of the DMZ going all the way down to the, the, the southern tip of the peninsula. That's a deterrent. If we would have left more people there scattered about, uh, even if we weren't actively engaging and we were just liaisoning with the military or the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army, this probably wouldn't be going on right now. They do it for attention. They do it because they can't and it's evil. I mean, there's bottom line, you know, not, you know, a lot of people say it's all Muslims, all Islamic, uh, but there's extremists and they're on the extreme side. They, they take the Quran, the Quran and twist it to their own way of wanting to, to do things. And, and for them, if you're not Muslim, you, you should be killed. But you gotta also understand, in, in their culture over there, the Christian crusades have never ended for them. So, you know, if you look at the hierarchy for the U.S., you know, we go God, country, family, you know, and, and we have things that, you know, our belief system. Uh, over there, they really don't have that same same standard that we do. Like, just trying to get the Iraqi army to defend their country was so low because they worried more about, you know, the religion, you know, and then, uh, you know, their tribe and their family. And country was way down here. There was no sense of patriotism. There was so, no, no sense of nationalism. No sense of wanting to take care of uh, really anybody outside their area. So when things would get hot, oftentimes the, the Iraqi army would retreat or pull back because there was no incentive for them to want to defend what they had. And we're seeing that now too is, you know, when the ISIL and ISIS came in, the Iraqi army were basically laying down arms like, nope, not us. You know, they had no motivation. I mean, most of us know Gary Sinise as an actor, as Lieutenant Dan. How do you know Gary Sinise? As I got more involved on the veteran advocate side of things and giving back to the community, we started running into each other at events. And then uh, he had, and what people don't realize about Gary Sinise is he, he had a lot of military in his family. You know, his father was World War II, his uncle was World War II, his brother-in-law was Vietnam. Uh, so when he lived in Chicago, he had a theater, or still has a theater there called Seth and Wolf. And every time they would do a dress rehearsal, the very first one, they'd bring veterans in to be the test audience. So Gary's been doing, giving back to the veteran community for over 30 years. Everybody thinks it's because of his role from Lieutenant Dan that got him involved. Uh, so they often think he's been doing it for 20 years because last year was the 20th anniversary of the movie. But he's actually been doing it a lot longer. And obviously he's been over to Iraq, he's been to Afghanistan, Kuwait, all over the world for the troops. And 2011, he actually formed the Gary Sinise Foundation uh, so he could better facilitate how he gives back and, and, and have some kind of, kind of organizational aspect to it. And so uh, he asked me to come speak at one of his fundraisers in D.C. And that was a big deal because up to that point, you know, we had just phone call here, handshake here and there and stuff. And the very next day after that, that fundraiser, he, I had phone home and that night he called me and he was like, hey, by the way, you know, you know, I formed my foundation and I'm putting together, you know, the people who like-minded who want to get back for the right reasons. And he goes, I have this thing, that it's a volunteer thing, but, you know, an, an ambassador, I'd like you to be an ambassador foundation. Really didn't know what that meant, but really what it is is just being a, a voice, um, you know, for the foundation for veterans. And then if Gary Sinise can't go somewhere, maybe I'll go in his place and share his, his expressions or his message. And, um, so he's become kind of a trusted friend. Yeah, and sometimes we go together. We've done a lot of events where it's just me and him. 
Um, you know, whenever they need me, they just kind of give me a call and let me know. If not, I just kind of promote what the mission's already doing. Um, Do you like motivational speaking? Uh, you know, I, I don't really like it too much. Um, I do it though because, uh, one, I can't. Um, you know, not everybody can tell their story and I think it's important for people to hear stories. Uh, there, there's a big disconnect between the, the civilian world and the military world and if the military doesn't share some of those stories, they're not going to understand. Uh, and, and we still need a lot of support. A lot of veterans are struggling right now. You know, unemployment's higher than it's ever been. Suicide rates higher than it's ever been. Homelessness is higher than it's ever been. We have all these things, rates just going skyrocketing. Well, if we don't share those stories, if we don't tell people about it, they don't know. Um, so I just accept the fact that because I can do it and I'm somewhat decent at it, that I might as well do it. Do they come up and tell you, even non-military people, you know, man, I was thinking about not doing this today. I mean, I look at you and see what you're doing, and I don't have any excuses. Do you hear that from the, I mean, the, I you hear know, it all the time from all kinds of people from, People who are going through their own struggles to people who think they shouldn't have struggles that are, um, you know, and, and my thing of it is that if I, you know, like, there's this thing that floats around Facebook and Instagram every now and goes, you know, I wake up every day so um, I can inspire people so that they can come up to me and say, hey, you, you inspire me. Um, I don't like that. I think that's one of the worst things in the world. I don't wake up to, to, to want to inspire anybody or have them come up and tell me I inspire them. If nobody ever told me the rest of my life that I inspired them, I'd be all right with that. Um, I was doing another interview with another media source uh, a couple months back and they said, if you could describe, uh, you know, what inspiration is in one word, you know, or how you would inspire somebody with one word, what would it be? And I said, action. And they kind of looked at me, I'm like, yeah, I mean, you, you can sit on Facebook or, or quote all these great, you know, motivational, inspirational quotes every single day. But if I'm just reading it and, and I look at your life and you're not living those quotes or you're not doing those things, uh, you're not inspiring anybody. But if you don't write those quotes down and you don't do that and you just go out and you live your life and you, and, and you do something, whether you could just, even if you're living in the gym and you're, you're getting physically fit, you're inspiring somebody just by doing that. Um, you know, you don't have to go out and do all these great things. It's just you have to live. You have to, you know, put yourself out there. And I think that's going to inspire more than than writing something down or being, you know, motivational, inspirational kind of stuff. Um, I talk about all kinds of things. A military bird would be different than a corporate bird. Right. Mm -hmm. So I've done every, but like I, I've did, I've done Coca Cola, Procter and Gamble. Uh, I've done some Wall Street stuff. A lot of it's based on leadership, um, you know, taking military leadership and transcribing it into corporate leadership. Um, then there's a, a lot of just, you know, what I call story time. Um, and I call it story time because they, they want to know your story. They want to know what it was like to be there. They want to know what your life is like now. So um, obviously that's probably the one I do the most, but I do a lot with like, I've, I've helped uh, businesses set up uh, hiring initiatives to get more veterans uh, employed. Uh, I've helped different organizations uh, set up internal veteran groups within their employment so that we can figure out the best way to hire veterans and um, get more people off the street. So um, I do what I consider leadership training, um, veteran advocate stuff, and then the motivational speaking is just whenever it presents itself. Yeah, but you gotta be careful on when when you're talking about the homeless. Though, if you go by VA standard, uh, if I'm a veteran and I have a friend's couch I can sleep on, I'm not homeless. I'm a dislocated veteran. So, uh, no, that guy is homeless. He is having a couch surf. That yeah, guy, couch surf. Uh, and, and that guy has nowhere to go. And if it wasn't for the generosity of his friends and the brotherhood, that that guy would be on the street. So that guy is homeless. Um, so this whole thing about, you know, their number game that the, the VA likes to play, I don't trust that. Um, we have a lot more homeless than what people realize we do. We have a lot more people couch surfing, 
garage surfing, all these new terms and stuff. I don't. I'm just now learning. Uh, bottom line is, these people have nowhere to go. Uh, and you know, when we talk about the unemployment, you know, and the suicide rate, all of that stuff is tied in together. Um, you know, if you have a veteran who comes off active duty, can't find a job. Maybe he has a little bit of savings, but sooner or later that savings is gone. Now he can't take care of him, he can't take care of his family, he becomes homeless. You know, the struggle gets even more. And eventually he is at the highest risk for suicide. Because what else is there for that guy? Have you had any friends from the suicide? Uh, more than I can count. And uh, I do a lot on the veteran advocate, or the suicide part. Uh, and so I've lost some that I was working with. I've, I was on the phone with one, and 45 minutes I got off the phone with him. And he, we couldn't locate him. We had the police out looking for him. He was out in the field. And uh, about 45 minutes after I was done talking to him, I, you know, he said goodbye on Facebook and shot himself. Was that after your injuries? Yeah. So, um, so you've been in even, even within my unit that I deployed with, we, we lost, um, we lost somebody in my unit. Um, so it, I, I've actually, it, as bad as it sounds, I've lost count of how many people I've known that commit suicide. But, uh, where do you fall on women? Being a former ranger instructor, where do you fall for, for um, women going through ranger school and beyond? You know, I, I, obviously we don't know what the beyond is. You know, this is in a, in a test phase. So I'm all for the test phase. Uh, I know some women that are, are pretty physically fit um, that would probably PT the crap out of me. Now, I don't know their mental strength. We, we haven't tested them enough to find out their mental mental strength yet. So uh, I think it's good that we at least test it, find out. Right now, numbers, um, I, I, the last I heard was like six females that would even be able to attend ranger school at the end of the month. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually passed the, the requirements of the pre-ranger course. Uh, that's PT, that's going through doing some, some uh, patrols and stuff. So I was out at RTB a few weeks ago and, and they let these females continue on with training. They, they can't go to ranger school because they've already failed something they didn't pass. Uh, but they were allowed to continue on with the training up till ranger school. That to me is more important. Uh, if they want to train, let's train them. Because think about going back at the beginning of the war with Jessica Lynch. Had Jessica Lynch been better trained and the people in her unit had been better trained, the stuff that happened that day might not have happened. Um, you know, when we talk about females in, in, in combat, you know, it's easy for us to be our chest saying, oh, they're not a guy, you know. Uh, but I know some women some serious trigger time. Uh, and I think if they want the shot at trying out for it, then so be it. But I think they have a tough road. 